reputation is a critical element of any artist's appeal and the way their audience forms and is shaped. When an artist dies without a formed reputation, their work ignored or unknown. Any fame that transfers to them does so as a myth, and myth is beyond the control of the departed. Nick Drake left us with three albums, both impossibly beautiful and clouded by horror, which, although critically adored, sold fewer than 5,000 copies between them. Other sources say 13,000 and others 20,000 when first released. There's no film of him, and only five live performances captured in a recording for John Peel's radio show. Doomed to his own demons, feeling imprisoned in the one place he felt even remotely safe, and bitterly disappointed at the progress of his career, he died. Either by misadventure, or by the sighing weariness that can overtake a man and call him to his oblivion. Nick Drake was born in Rangoon, in what was then called Burma, in 1948, his father being a diplomat stationed there. In 1950, the family moved back to England, where his father took work as the managing director of an engineering firm. Nick's boyhood was comfortable and somewhat idyllic. He was an athletic child who still holds some track and field records at Marlborough School. He played in several bands at Marlborough. At one point, a future lady in red perpetrator, Chris de Berg, asked to join Nick's band and he was sent packing for being too poppy. Before going to Cambridge to study English literature, he spent six months with friends bumming around France, Spain and Morocco, where he became acquainted with pot and LSD and worked obsessively on his guitar technique. It was at Cambridge that the first signs of his psychological disintegration began to manifest themselves as he abandoned his previously athletic self and began to spend days in his room, listening to records, smoking pot, playing guitar and barely talking to anyone. In 1968, Drake drifted to playing club gigs, a lot to which his crushing introversion and awkwardness ill suited him. But after a gig at the Roadhouse opening for Country Joe and the Fish, Ashley Hutchings of Fairport Convention was suitably impressed to A, arrange for him to open for them as they debuted their Legion Leaf album, and B, arranged an audition with Joe Boyd, Fairport's producer. Boyd said he decided he had to sign Drake up for hearing only a few bars of his first song. The problem was now Drake was recording an album. No one had any real idea on how best to record him. The debut album, Five Leaves Left, the message contained in packets of Rizla cigarette papers indicating the propinquity to the end of the packet, critical information for dope smokers, and was released in early 1969. Boyd had tried to replicate the intimate sound of Leonard Cohen's debut album by sitting Drake on a stool amidst a semicircle of musicians. Drake's by now loathing of live performance meant next to no promotion for the album and next to no sales. The record had its champions, onboard British DJ and tastemaker John Peel and Ireland's record owner Chris Whitehorse, who put Drake on retainer in particular, but it never had the chance to grip the public imagination. The truth is it's a beautiful record, filled with songs unique and uniquely flawed gems which emphasise Drake's wonderful gift for melody, his use of symbolic language and his nimble and intelligent guitar playing over a surprisingly smooth but undramatic baritone. Highlights are Time Has Told Me which has an optimistic tone and a sweet countryish melody, the much covered Riverman with its 5-4 time and relatively rare standard tuning, imagined by many to be the centrepiece of the record, is a metaphysical, or symbolist, I never could tell the difference, observation on the inevitability of change in the ages that bring it. Drake's voice plays beautifully against his warm, ambling guitar playing. Way to Blue, a painful meditation on depression and helplessness, marred perhaps by an overimposing string arrangement. Day is Done is another ponderance on being unable to make simple human connections, painful and almost pathetic, where again the strings are intrusive. For me, Cello Song is the highlight of the record. It's Drake 
addressing the man he was or wants to be and strikes an even tone of regret or hope depending on which side of the mirror you're looking at. The guitar playing is sprightly and interesting and the bongos jolly it along nicely. Fruit Tree is a much celebrated song where Drake questions his choice to operate in a business so far from his comfort zone and expose his very fragile psyche to failure which he had never before known and he knew would crush him. Drake left Cambridge nine months short of his degree. His father admonished him saying a degree was a safety net under his music career. You don't understand, cried Drake. The last thing I want is a safety net. The jazzy Saturday Sun is the other standout, one that describes the duality of mixed life from joy to gloom in a day, to find your heart full of hope, and as yet Keats said, it's the day is gone and all its sweets are gone. Amidst all the disappointment of Five Leaves Left's non-existent sales and the increasing chaos of Drake's existence in London, where he lived by couch surfing, and occasional flights back home to Tamworth and Arden, where he felt safe but imprisoned. There were odd occasional triumphs, such as the Royal Albert Hall gig with Fairport Convention, where, depending on who you listen to, he either held the audience spellbound or completely failed to go over with them. But more commonly, there were nights like the gigs at the trendy club Cousin, where he couldn't remember the songs and had to restart or abandon them. It was also around this time friends report the first signs of psychosis, most probably brought on by Drake's truly immense cannabis consumption. Drake's second album, Brighter Later, is in my opinion his best. Boyd brought in jazzier, more expansive arrangements to try and introduce Drake to a wider audience. But he did so without diluting or changing Drake's music to any great extent, is a credit to Boyd. Drake also came armed with better songs, with more varied melodies, even if the themes hadn't necessarily changed. Hazy Jane too, with its upbeat Van Morrison arrangement, sees Drake still surrounded by the problems he worked on in Five Leaves Left, but the failure of that album has made him a little more bitter about the world in general. But as always, injecting a bit of Hazy Jane into the conversation makes the world tolerable for Drake. And I think we all know who or what Hazy Jane is. At the Chime of a City Clock is one of my favourite of Drake's songs. A lovely, sprightly melody, enchanting guitar playing and a lyric about being in the place to fit in, wanting to fit in, but finding it easier and more comfortable just to blend into the background unheard and unnoticed. Drake was living in Hampstead at the time and wrote most of the songs from the album sitting under the oak trees on the heath. Perhaps it reminded him of the bucolic days of childhood. One of these things first, while blessed with a jolly melody and if not optimistic, at least self-aware lyrics, is obtuse beyond the obvious thought that Drake is regretting his choice to follow his views and feels he had higher purposes that he could have pursued. The instrumental title track showcases Drake's guitar playing mightily as he weaves an intricate bossa nova over sympathetic drums and a sweet flute and string arrangement. Fly, on which Drake worked with John Cale, is a tuneful and plaintive wish to be able to summon the strength to connect and ruin the chances his shyness and inability to communicate have cost him. Poor Boy, another pretty bossa nova, is interesting for its more expansive arrangements and for the all intents and purposes a sexual drake, wishing for a woman to dress in white for him and, and for him to take a wife, but he also feels bound to his peripatetic lifestyle. It's a remarkably clear-headed song from a man whose world was constantly falling apart. Northern Sky is one of Drake's most enduring songs and the closest he came to a love song. The tragedy of it is that these sentiments such as this could only exist for him in song. It just wasn't a conversation or perhaps even a genuine emotional state that Drake could express intimately. And when he asks, would you love me till I'm dead, a dread chill enters the room. The failure of the small tour set up to promote the album all but did for Drake as a live performer. The 
Hey Noddy No crowd in the English folk scene wanted rousing sing-along choruses and the audiences in the working man's clubs ignored him and talks over his songs, which broke his heart. By the late spring of 1971, he was on the edge. Ensconced at home in Tamworth, he would sit for days staring at the Warwickshire countryside. The loss of his producer and confidant, Joe Boyd, who went to work in America, was a terrible blow for him. Ireland Records supremo Chris Whitewurst offered Nick use of his villa in Spain to recuperate. On his return in October 1971, he contacted his engineer, John Wood, and surprised him by saying he was ready to go back into the studio. After two nights at the end of that month, he recorded his final album, The Astonishing Pink Moon. An 11-song effort with a shorter running time than the first Ramones album, it's frequently compared to Robert Johnson, and it must be said the looming spectre of doom does haunt the album. Or does it? Are we perhaps forming a theory to support a known outcome? Drake always knew he was sick. By the time he recorded Pink Moon, he'd seen a psychiatrist who was still given to neglecting his medicines in some bloody-minded determination to overcome his demon himself. But Pink Moon shows a deepening slough of despond, even if it is melodically superior and his guitar playing reaches new heights. Open up Pink Moon is based around the image of the Pink Moon, colloquially the first full moon of April, the harbinger of spring, of change, of better things, and of those who can't change perishing. Drake sings about those who stand so tall being claimed by the Pink Moon. Nick Drake was six foot three, just say. Place to be on the face of it is a lovely tuneful song, which I tend to think is about Drake's wildly vacillating moods, his realisation that he had potential, his stubbornness and refusal to give in on a foundering music career and the knowledge that dark times were always just around the corner. Which Will is another of these rare love songs, but this is one of unrequited love with a tinge of bitterness. If not me, who will you love? One of his out-and-out -out folksiest numbers with mazy guitar pickings, reminiscent of Robert Johnson's style. The hushed tones of Drake's pained voice are a lonesome cry for the ages. Horn is a fragmentary instrumental which somehow encompasses human grief in the manner of Blind Willie Johnson. It's not complex, not technically dazzling, but the sound of a man retreating to a world where no one can reach him. Things Behind the Sun, crouched as it is in Blakeian imagery, I think is a song about how burdensome Nick is finding the business of communicating to others and trying to warn people off that if he doesn't want to talk to them, it's because he can't. He doesn't understand or trust the world enough to open up to it. Parasite is a sad reflection on Nick's feeling of failures, his loneliness, and his feeling that he no longer belongs in a world filled with people who have it together in a way he can only wish for. This is virtually the soundtrack of a man abandoning his life. The album ends with From the Morning, its haunting lyrics, Now we rise and we are everywhere, being the inscription on Drake's gravestone. An achingly beautiful song of a man prepared to go to the undiscovered country rather than live in one he was so ill-adapted to dwell in for the moment. After Pink Moon's inevitable failure, Drake collapsed utterly. After spending five weeks in a mental institution and emerging no different, he gave up speaking, bathing, even moving in his chair for days on end. Gradually, he clawed himself back onto his medication and remarkably went back to the studio to record four more songs, including the utterly bleak black-eyed dog, the hellhound on his trail. The guitar playing on this song is remarkable, and Drake's song is haunting and haunted. A proposal to work with French singer Francois Hardy offered Drake further purpose as he set himself to work writing once again. But all of the fresh promise came to naught when on the morning of November 24th, 1974, Nick Drake's mother came into his room to check on him after an all-night writing session and found him dead on his bed. Death was, initially, no kinder to Drake's reputation, 
than his living days had been. His recorded works were almost immediately taken out of print and apart from a couple of brief repressings of Pink Moon, stayed that way for 15 years. A compilation album brought to the attention of, if not the public, then a select cadre of musicians who began to cite Drake as an influence. What put Drake over the top was in 1999 when Volkswagen used Pink Moon in an ad and youngsters started using Napster to source and distribute his long out of print catalogue. He became a hip name to add to soundtracks in trendy youth oriented films. His good looks, vulnerability and inscrutable lyrics became popular with the mopey dopey crowd looking for a new Kurt Cobain. He became fashionable. He would have hated it. Fame, he said, was a fruit tree. If he could taste the uncertain fruit it bore him, would he find it sweet on his palate? I think not. Life is but a memory happened long ago. Nick Drake was a wounded soul, a committed poet and a remarkable guitarist. He was a legend lost to light. Now that in death the fame he craved has found him, I'm not sure if he wasn't better served 